Welcome, welcome, welcome to Stock Market Live. Thanks for tuning in today, joining us. We got everybody showing up right now. We got Anna, we got Charles, Dan, Nick, Ralph, everybody. Welcome if you're joining us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. I'm Daniel Snyder here on Stock Market Live, your 12 o'clock lunch hour. Thanks for joining us today. Grab a drink, grab a lunch, do what you do. We've got everybody showing up. Brian, Charles, I think I said Charles already. Uh, but you guys know I'm joined here by Mike Saul. You might know the man, the myth, the legend from Monday's webinars of what's happening in the stock market found here on Seeking Alpha. Mike, obviously there's a lot going on in the market today. We've got a full show. We're joined by a special guest, Scott Kaufman from High Dividend Opportunities. We'll get to him here probably towards the bottom of the hour. And we're going to start, though, because we've got a lot to talk about. We have a stock that was pitched to us last week. We're going to break that down as well as talk about Apple, because obviously Apple's event is today in one hour, and we're going to make sure that we wrap this up so that everybody can get over to that event right after this, because we're all waiting to see what happens. But Mike, what's got your eyes right now in the market? What are you watching? Well, right now I'm, I'm watching crude oil kind of collapse. Um, it was holding on to its 200-day moving average. I'm, I'm doing it using the futures just the uh, October contract, but you can use, uh, if you don't have access to futures, you could pull up USO, you could pull up OIL, whatever you'd like to, whatever you'd like to use, but the futures are the purest form. And I'm talking about the, uh, this is Western Texas, whatever it is, intermediate or the sweet oil, right? Whatever that is. Um, WTI. Yeah. So, so uh, what happened was, Crude oil came down in August, tested its 200-day moving average, got a bump up to the 50-day moving average and played a little pinball there, rejected, and then hit, came back to the 200-day, stayed there for three days. Then over the weekend, there was news from OPEC Plus said they, they're going to cut production. So I buy whatever, and it's 100,000 barrels a day or whatever it was, and crude oil popped 3%. It was short-lived. And it was barely hanging on to the 200 day. And today, as I'm watching it right now, it's down 4.2%, but it's pretty volatile. And it's down to the low 80s, the lowest number it has been. If it closed here, it would be the lowest close since February. So uh, I have support sitting lower at about 7150, which is still, you know, I mean, what's that? Another 10, another $11 here. Uh, 11 from eight is what I'm doing the math quick, 14%, whatever it is. Right. I mean, you know, whatever I, I, I we can round up. So oil, right. I mean, for, for the, the next support level I'm looking at still has about another 15% down. So again, I mean, people who are complaining about gas prices, which by the way, is all of us are going to be a little happier because uh, gas will come down off of this. So that's good. But uh, you know, again, uh, what is it saying, right? It, right? What is energy saying, right? Energy stocks have been one of the strongest, I mean, have, sorry, have been the strongest group in the market this year. There are only two groups that were green coming into this week, energy and utilities. And if, uh, unless energy collapses here, which it doesn't look like it's going to do, but it's just pulling back for now, energy will still be positive on the year. But you know, we saw Warren Buffett plowing with Berkshire Hathaway plowing into Occidental. We saw the nice moves in stocks like Devon Energy and, and Exxon, et cetera, a whole bunch of them. Uh, but now they're taking a rest here. So yeah. where is that rotation going? Uh, looks like the rotation is going to the broad market, uh, to, the, to the other groups in the broad market, and specifically into retail. So one of the stocks that I mentioned before this and, and, and uh, was Ulta, right? So Ulta Beauty, U-L-T-A, is... The symbol it's breaking out today it's up 2.3 percent and one of the things about a, a, a stock like ulta beauty is uh, they sell cosmetics and cologne that's what i bought my cologne and i'm not kidding by the way that sounds like a joke because why do i need cologne i work from home but actually when i had to go back to the office a couple of years ago i said you know i don't feel like smelling like an animal every day so i'm gonna buy a little bit of cologne all right really bad digression there but it's a cosmetic place and it's a very popular place right so why is a stock like ulta breaking out why is a specialty retail stock like ulta breaking out well there's something that coincidentally is known as the lipstick effect. So when times are tough, economic, economic 
go wise, right? Or in the economy, there we go. Economy wise, what happens is people say, you know what? Instead of four uh, four vacations this year, maybe I'll only go on two. Maybe I'll hold off on the the boat purchase or on mm-hmm. the or on the big car purchase. But what they want to do is they still want to feel special and they still want to treat themselves. That's why you see things like coffee shops are busier, right? Because people are like, well, I'm not giving up my coffee. And what they do is they like to buy small luxury items such as expensive lipstick or nice cosmetics. So a stock like Ulta is, it's not recession proof. I, I don't believe in that term, but it's recession resistant. How about that? Because people still want to spend their, look, in the United States, we are rabid purchasers. We are rabid consumers. People love to spend money, right? So if they can't buy the big purchases, they still want to feel like they're treating themselves. And that's why they go to things like Ultra Beauty, et cetera. Whoa. Sorry about that. Whoa, it's hey. a, solid, it's hey. a solid point, man. we got a concert going on on your side, but it's a solid anyway. point, right? And that's, and that's one thing that we're looking for is we're looking for the Apple event today. Is Apple going to introduce a new pricing plan to bring the price point down on their devices potentially for people to feel like they can afford those things and still splurge on those spins? Right. And, and one of the things with Apple that I'm really looking for is I'm looking for Apple to come out with an all-in-one subscription product, right? And I think they what is have it called? Apple One, right? Apple but, but One. Looking- you can get Apple TV. You can get uh, iCloud space. I mean, they're they're working on the games and news and right. But how about this, Daniel? How about the for somebody like you who is in the ecosystem, right? You talked about that last week. How you're in the Apple ecosystem already. You have it all. You have the the ear the ear pods. You have the the phone. You have the MacBook. Whatever it is. How about you don't sit around and worry about when the next iPhone's coming out. You're on a subscription plan. You get it automatically. It's automatically sent to you, right? So Amazon tried this a while ago with these this zero-click ordering, right, where they just send you stuff, and if you don't like it, you send it back. Didn't really work that well. I'm still thinking that could be the future of e-commerce, but it didn't work right out of the gate because people are like, I'm not sending it back and I'm not paying. So how about that? But anyway, but but so what if Apple came out with a supercharged subscription plan where now not only do you get everything that you mentioned, the streaming service, uh, you know, all that stuff, but what about if you also got the new phone when it come, came out automatically? And here's what you do. You'll get the new phone. Your payments will just keep continuing. That's something, and, and you know, this ties into Ulta Beauty also, not directly, but also what we talked about with, uh, with the lipstick effect is people in tough times, people cut costs, but what they don't cut are things that they feel they really need. And something like getting a new iPhone every, one, every time one comes out, I know, look, I, I'm on an eight, right? And I'm fine with my eight. But whatever, the point, a lot of people think, no, I got to have the new iPhone. I'm going to keep this subscription going. And every six months when Apple comes out with a new phone, I'm going to get that. That's a priority for me. That's, oh my goodness. Hey, Google, stop. How about that? Um, you need the Apple that, Siri that, HomePod. That, there you go. You know, it, it could, that could be a priority in this economy. So yeah, I don't expect Apple to announce something like that today. From what I saw, it looks like they're going to boost the prices a little bit, about 100 bucks a piece. They're going to make bigger screens on the phones and all that stuff. So we'll see, right? I, I don't know what to expect here, if it's going to be a, you know, a, a rager or a dud, but it's definitely something to pay attention to. Like you said, Daniel, it's, it's yeah, an important yeah. day. We've got some, uh, let's, we got to, we got to move the show along. Let's get into some of these charts that we brought for everybody. Obviously we want to start with the overall markets. Uh, Mike, I know you brought some charts. Josh, let's go chart on, put it up for us. The first slide. There we go. Mike, what are we looking at here? Okay. So the S and P 500 last week, um, if I talked about how this projected trend line was coming into play, well, it hit that trend line yesterday. That's this red candle right here. I think you could see my arrow. It pushed down below it, but it closed right on it. And today we're getting a bounce. So right here could be potential support and we could get a potential bounce here. Again, I am not calling a low. I am not saying we're going to go to new highs from here. This is a short term, even though it's a daily chart and it looks at the bigger trend. I'm looking for a short term potential bounce here. And if this doesn't hold, 
Well, that says it can go down to one of your favorite areas, which I know, Daniel, I'm sure you'll talk about it, is this gap down here, right? So right here, in my opinion, I don't know if this is the bull's last stand, if, if we have to hold here. I, I, I'd like not to get that dramatic, but I think it's an important inflection point. And if it gets a bounce here, let's see how far we can get. Maybe we can get back to the 50-day moving average up here, which is this blue line. Or if we don't, maybe if we just fizzle out, then we could accelerate down to that gap. Well, let's look at the levels. Josh, next slide. I actually pulled this chart myself. From my side, I ran a little Fibonacci because, you know, I love the Fibonacci retracements. And there you go. Matching up with the uh, the moving averages, as you just pointed out. You see the gap I've drawn there below the market. That's kind of what we're looking to, to fill. You hear me week after week, 80% of the time gaps fill. Now also there is a gap above the market, but that might not fill for a long time. That could have been a gap and go for all we know. Um, but we're definitely seeing the bounce right there on the 61.8 retracement as well, which max uh, matches up with that moving average like you were talking about. Um, and real quick, Elsie, I see your question here. Where can we watch the Apple conference? You can actually watch it on YouTube. They do stream it live. Uh, it'll be up at 1 p.m., I think I actually have it pulled out myself. There's over 100,000 people waiting for the, the conference to start, and obviously we want to have you guys be able to get that as well. So let's keep running. Mike, talk to me about the queues. Josh, next chart. Okay, so the queues, different story. The queues broke their projected trend line, right, which is now a real trend line. It tried to hold it last week. So today is Wednesday. So it was Wednesday, Tuesday, Friday, because Monday we were closed, Thursday, and then Wednesday. So the day we were doing this last week, it came down, tested this trend line, held it, broke below it, tried to remount it on Friday, but turned around and traded lower. Once again, I'm sure you'll show this gap. But uh, right here, if we can't get back above that trend line, then it's looking like we could head back down to this gap. And th these are minimum targets, by the way. OK, I'm still thinking that we, we test the lows, but. That, that's a different right now we're just looking short term and what also can happen when trend lines get broken and then they're retested from underneath right it's called um the it's called the change of the oh wow i don't know what it's called anymore wow i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm getting a a little brain uh a little brain pause there but yeah, it's, uh, it's called the whatever it is but it's it's when previous support becomes resistance, becomes resistance. Yep. change of polarity, change of polarity. There we go. I knew I'd get it. That's in Steve Nissan's book, Beyond Candlesticks. So this is previous support. It held here. When it comes up to retest it, change of polarity, it may hold as resistance and roll back down here. Again, putting the cart in front of the horse, because right now all it's doing is getting a little bit of a bounce here. But this breakdown here of this trend line, doesn't really look too bullish to me on the NASDAQ. Yeah, same. Josh, let's go to the next chart here. I have the same thing. I was pulling this. And also, I meant to say the trend line on the SPY chart, not the moving average. But you see, we're also getting this reaction. The same thing on the Qs as we saw on the SPY. That 0.618 retracement is just becoming a little bit of a level of support is where they're battle. It's almost like a battle zone, right, between the bulls and the bears, trying to figure out who's going to take the lead here. But I agree with you. I mean, overall market feels, we know it's still a risk off market. It doesn't feel too bearish right here. Definitely a few key levels to watch. Obviously, we might go all the way back down to that 269.28 that we saw at the bottom of June. But obviously, time will tell. All right, walk us through IWN, please, Mark. Or Mike, sorry. <laughs> okay, either one is right. I answered to all names. It's okay. So this is the Russell 2000 ETF. This is the small caps. Why are the small caps important? Well, the small caps are the highest speculative stocks that and, and you could go more and you could say no, the penny stocks, whatever. I'm talking about stocks that are actually real companies, right, that make it to a Russell, the Russell 2000. So right here, uh, we have not hit the trend line yet. I'm just projecting it here because as we talked about last week, it's only at two points right now. It can't be a real trend line until it tests uh, three points, but I'm projecting it here. So the Russell is showing better relative strength. It's still nothing great. It's still below the 200 day and below the 50 day moving average, but at least it's it hasn't tested its trend line yet. So again, we'll see if we continue lower what it does at that trend line. But on the upside, if it were to bounce, I want to watch that freshly broken 50-day moving average, which you see here. It gapped down below it, came up and tested it again on Friday, and now it's trading lower once again. So that's what I'm seeing on, on the Russell.
Yeah, Josh, next chart, please. Here we go once again, right back to that Fibonacci level. That's why I pointed out time and time again. Obviously, IWM is the weakest part of the market typically when we're seeing downturns, a lot of small companies, um, all the things that Mike said as well. So just something to keep a look on. Now, before we move on, I actually have something I just stumbled upon uh, this morning while I was looking across Twitter feed. And Mike, I want to throw this up and I want you to tell me which stock, you know, kind of sticks out to you the most. Why don't we go ahead and to the next slide, Josh. This is 2022 returns on some of the biggest names covered across the market. And this was pulled, this was yesterday from Charlie. If you don't follow him, he's a great follow. Does a lot of charts, has a great newsletter. Which one sticks out to you the most here? Wow, trick question. Uh, this is proof that we do not uh, commiserate before because I uh, hope I don't get the answer wrong here. <laughs> uh, so what I'm looking at, let me let me see. This is year-to-date returns. Now, the interesting one at the top, right, Twitter, only down 11% with everything going on with the Elon Musk trial. Obviously, we had the news come out, whistleblower is going to be allowed to be a part of the trial, but it's, you know, they're not going to accommodate Elon Musk and his uh, team on the yeah, timing delay, of the trial. They, yeah, they were trying to delay the trial because there's no, allegedly there's no, what they, their argument was, was there's no rush which i don't understand but anyway they already denied that so yeah twitter doesn't stand out for me because it has artificial you know it's it's a merger so it, it has artificial mm -hmm. umph to it sitting out i mean if i was looking at all of all of this stuff i would probably look at i i, I would probably look at apple only being down 13 percent when a lot of its cohorts are down uh you know or at least down the 20s right i mean the, the yeah. former thing Meta or I guess uh, Mang right now that it's uh, now it's Meta instead of Facebook down off more than half. Although I'm not surprised we talked about Meta last week and we you know Meta platforms last week and uh, and we, we talked about how weak it was. But yeah, but Apple was the one that that stands out I guess the the most to me uh, on this one. And of course Tesla. But again, that doesn't surprise me either because the fan base is so large there. But um, yeah, so so yours is Twitter. Yours is Twitter, the one that stands no, out. No, actually, most? I was gonna say I think mine's actually GameStop. You know, AMC, Bed Bath Beyond. We're seeing all of those meme stocks get destroyed, and and GameStop's towards the top of of this list. I would I would I was a little surprised. I thought it would be closer to the bottom with all of that. Um, right. But anyways, just an yeah, interesting chart point. for everybody to look or a uh, interesting graph for everybody to look at. Um, Mike, why don't you go ahead? I want to go ahead and tell everybody. Hold on one second, Josh. Go ahead and take that down for me. Um, we have a seeking office service now called Alpha Picks. Mike, I, I was wondering if you might be able to tell the people what Alpha Picks is about. Just real quick. Okay, so what Alpha Picks does is Alpha Picks takes the best of the best from the quant ratings and backs it up with research behind it. So what it does is, look, I, I am a, I read a lot, but I'm a slow reader. And I always have been. It's, it's definitely one of my curses. Um, that and my incredible good looks, you know, that's very tough. Uh, a lot of people don't take me seriously because I'm so handsome, but um, I'm a very slow reader. So when I have to go through and I'm researching a stock on Seeking Alpha, it takes me hours to do it because there's so much information and I'm very easily drawn to the rabbit holes. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you enjoy, that's fine. But what Alpha Picks does is now it takes me about 11 minutes to, and that's because I'm a slow reader. For normal readers, forget fast readers, it takes about six minutes to read all the research backing it up. You know the stock has strong quant ratings, otherwise it wouldn't be on the list, right? But that, that's not what would make, make it there. And it gives you two picks a month. So even if you're a, an, a complete, no, I do it all myself. Okay, that's great. But now you have something else right so now what you can do is while you're looking for the next apple the next tesla the next whatever you're looking for you have something else to to keep you going right so it's what is the saying daniel right give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day teach a man to fish he'll eat for a lifetime okay but what if it takes a couple of days to teach him how to fish he's gonna starve so how about giving him a couple of fish while you're teaching him to fish right and that's why alpha picks is so great because now we're, you're getting the fish and you can mange while you're also doing the research on your own stuff. And look, 
$99 a year. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm laughing. That's not a, for some people, that's a lot of money. I'm not mocking anybody who, who can't afford that. So please don't, uh, don't take it that way. I just think it's ridiculous. It's such an attractive, to put it mildly, an attractive value. Two plays a month, $99 for the entire year. And this isn't somebody just screaming about insider this or that or hype this or all that. It's backed by the quant ratings, which is also, you know, it's the only place in the world where you get two stocks a month that are top quant rated and have the research to back it up. Nobody else can do this because nobody else has the quant ratings that Seeking Alpha does. Stephen Kress, head of quantitative strategies, 35 years on the street, consulting to hedge funds, institutions. I mean, anyway. Anyways, I mean, that, that's a that's a great breakdown. Obviously, we're talking about, I mean, everything that you guys listen to here with us, this is our own opinions, our bias. It's not investment advice. Obviously, do your own research. But obviously, as he's mentioning, Alpha Picks is backed by the quant rating system, which remo removes human bias. So that's just something I want to highlight to you. I'm going to have Josh drop the link in the chat for everybody if you want to check it out, learn a little bit more about it. Um, and let's keep this show moving. Next up, let's get into the segment where last week we asked you all if you had a stock that you would like us to research and analyze and take a look at for you. And William actually sent us an email. We always encourage everybody here to recommend a stock as well. There are a few guidelines. We'll get to that at the end of the show. But his stock that he recommended that we take a look at is called S Tech Incorporated, ticker GWH. The share price is roughly about $3.50. Um, so let's break it down. What is this company about? Well, uh, S Tech Energy, or sorry, S Tech is a small cap company based out of Oregon focused on energy storage. They design and produce batteries for commercial and utility scale energy storage applications worldwide. The company just IPO'd in October of last year and raised about $250 million for operational expenses. Josh, let's go ahead and throw up that slide of the Seeking Alpha Quant grades, the ratings. Sorry, let's go back one more. Oh, sorry, this is GWH, S Tech. Forgot that one was in there. There you go. Next slide. Here's the rating summary. We have Seeking Alpha author saying that the stock is a buy right now. Wall Street think, thinks this is a buy as well. The quant rating system thinks it is a hold at this time. So let's get into it. Uh, next slide, Josh. Just take a look at the factor grades real quick. Valuations to C, profitability is an F, and we'll touch on that in a second. But let's go to the next slide as well, which is the capital structure. I added this in here because I wanted you guys to notice something about this company. Like I said, they IPO'd last year. $250 million in cash. They're now down in the most recent quarter to about $192 million. Their debt is pretty non-existent. That's okay. Obviously, um, as I mentioned last week, I think it was as well, Peter Lynch says, you know, if you have more cash than debt, how are you going to go bankrupt? Um, there, there's ways to over leverage, of course, but this company uh, has a good amount of cash that they're sitting on right now. So the issue that I have with this company currently is that not much revenue is even being brought in. Um, it was founded over a decade ago. Sales for the year are estimated to land at $3.57 million. That's not a lot. Uh, so what's the big story here, though? The company is focused on creating a battery that is different and, and is there to compete against the lithium-ion batteries. So they're trying to remove lithium from the batteries um, to, to avoid that entire supply chain issue that lithium is having at this time. Uh, the, the solution they have designed is claimed by the company to be more cost effective, which only time is really going to tell on that front. Uh, but they also eliminated the combustion issue of batteries or the, um, non, the, the flammable issues with batteries. So their batteries are non flammable and do not combust, which might be good for the galaxy phones, uh, made by Samsung. Remember the airplane stuff that happened a while ago on that. Um, and they're bad. They claim that their batteries will operate better in a desert environment, which I'm sure, I mean, before we know it, California might be a desert with the heat wave they have going on. So obviously I said lithium's in high demand, but revenue for this company in Q2 was only $686,000, um, which is a little worrisome. The non-GAAP operating expenses for Q2 were $21.9 million. So they're burning a significant amount of cash that they raised uh, to operate right now. Um, and they expect end year. They expect to end the year with 120 million dollars in cash. So, what are the highlights of this company? If you're considering this company, uh, well, they've had five upward fiscal year EPS revisions from Wall Street analysts that are covering S Tech. 
the seeking alpha factor grades are pretty appealing, except for that profitability. Obviously, revenue needs to increase. They need to be able to generate more cash to then reallocate. I mean, I get it. If you're a growth company, you're working on it. This is a big energy transformation play. There's a lot going on here. Uh, highlights they have enough cash to cover debt, which I mentioned. And also on the last earnings call, one thing that peaked out to me was uh, Colin Rush from Oppenheimer was actually on the call. And usually it's kind of weird to see big name analysts on uh, covering smaller companies like this. So what else is going on here? Well, Eric Dressel Heis, I think that's how you say his last name. He's the CEO currently. Kept mentioning during the earning call, actually his CFO as well, they're thinking that they're going to be a key player when the Inflation Reduction Act gets passed here. So they said that they match all of the requirements that are needed for this. They think that they're going to get some of the incentives being thrown out through this act. Um, they think this is going to be potentially the next catalyst to move the company forward. Something to watch for because obviously, you know, it's a midterm election year. There's a lot going on. Um if you're waiting on that as the catalyst of your company, I'm a little worried in that regard because that might get dragged on a little bit. Obviously, we saw Build Back Better get pushed and pushed and pushed. I mean, politics is politics, right? So be cautious on that front. Um, but also, they and I quote from the earnings call, uh, as we have ramped new vendors, we have seen their delivery times push out due to their own supply challenges. This has already slowed our production schedule for their product, which is these energy warehouses. Um, and while we still see a path to our original plan of shipping 40 to 50 energy warehouses this year, we would likely be near the low end of the range and possibly below it, depending on our ability to resolve these supply chain issues. So this company is dealing with supply chain issues. That's that's the lowdown. They say it's not because of them. They say it's because of their vendors, but you need to you broaden out your vendors. Um, the company does not pay a dividend. Short interest on this company is 12.86% of the float. Uh, the worries here is, does their battery work? Is it more cost effective than lithium ion batteries? Um, can they capture purchase orders during this time to generate the revenue that seems to be missing right now? And if they increase their revenue, will management then increase stock-based compens compensation, diluting the current shareholders to keep their expenses down. Um, so what if you're dead set, set on this stock? What should you do, right? I think at this time, I personally would recommend just setting a quant rating alert on Seeking Alpha to see if it flips from a hold to a buy. Um, it's a little, this is a very, very speculative play, right? You're talking about a transformation within the market of we're not only revolutionizing batteries, but they are then using these energy warehouses um, they, they have clients in Australia, they have clients in New Zealand, they're looking at Europe and North America, they're in Tampa, they're, um, I think Pennsylvania as well, I read, they're, they're starting to create these energy warehouses, but you're only talking about eight to 10 hours of energy to help cities maybe during peak hours. So this company has a long way to go, they're competing against the likes of Tesla, which is also doing something similar. Um, so keep that in mind. And we know that Tesla has a lot of good contracts with suppliers around the world for these battery supplies for how they are making their batteries. Um, me, personally, it's a very, very speculative play. So if you're playing speculation on it, uh, make it a very, very small percentage of your portfolio. I mean, we're talking about you you have to believe in this for maybe a decade or longer. Um, that's the rundown on S-Tech. So let's get into the charts. Mike, why don't you walk us through what you're seeing on S-Tech's chart here? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a look, I will disclose this by saying, uh, or give the disclaimer by saying, the stock and the company are oftentimes not, you don't know, are not the same thing, right? They're not the same thing. So how the stock looks, I am not crapping on the vision of the company or the bull. I, I don't know anything about that. I didn't do enough research. The chart is a dumpster fire. There's no other way Horrible. to put it, right? It was a previous SPAC right? Uh, or it was a SPAC. It came out. It sold off pretty significantly. The all-time low is $2.59. It's trading around three sixty dollars now. So whatever it is. Um, the good news is your downside is $3.60, right? All it can do is go to zero if you're not using leverage with it, right? If you're using leverage, if somebody gave you margin on a $3.60 stock, then you could lose more than your investment, right? But if you're just using cash, your downside is zero. If you believe in the story, if there's a reason that you like it, your risk is defined. Back out from that. Assume it's going to zero and then size appropriately. That's what I would do. You can do whatever you want. You could, 
you know, burn your money for fuel if you want. I don't care, right? It's up to you. I'm not giving personal advice here. But what I would do if I love the story and think this is going to be it, I would back it out and assume it's going to zero. The chart does not give me any reason to be bullish here. That doesn't mean that the company doesn't have great things ahead of it and a great vision. But a lot of these SPACs, right, were built on the story. And this has a good story, right? Okay, that's a great story. Hey, they're going to solve the energy crisis. Okay, great. But let's see if they actually can go through. Like you said, the burn rate is pretty high. So yeah, uh, cash on hand relative to debt isn't bad. But if they're continuing to burn like they're burning every quarter, that cash on hand is going to get, get you know, a pa- yeah. you know, sliced it away. Gives them, it gives them about two years of runway, and then they have to raise more capital or more cash, right? So right. they're going to give them more? In that. Who's going to give them more, right? Maybe, maybe exactly. we'll see SPAC 3.0, right? Because we already saw SPAC 2.0, right? And maybe people will be like, hey, look at this. It's an old SPAC. I don't know. But, you know, and look, Wall Street has a short memory. A lot of these places, they raise fresh money. Look at the, I forget his name, Adam Newman. I just remembered his name. We were guy, yeah. Yeah, he raised more money, right? So if he can raise more money, uh, whatever. But again, you made a valid point. You can't rely on that as your catalyst. And you can't, this isn't your catalyst that that they're going to change the world. And great advice, and the only advice you technically gave, which is, Watch for the quant rating, put a quant rating alert on this and see if it changes and then start to consider it, right? That's not a yep. buy in and of itself, but it's something that, okay, now at least I got the quant at my back. Now I could start considering it, right? right. So it takes my human different. bias out of the equation, right? Which Absolutely. is what we're talking about when it comes to the quant. So, all right. Thank you, Mike. We're going to go ahead and keep this going. Obviously, um, thank you, William for sending in that stock. Great to cover that for you. We'll ask everybody else here at the end of the episode, if you have any other stocks you want us to take a look at for you, break down the speaking alpha quant rating system, the earning calls, all of that stuff. We'll get to that here in a little bit, but go ahead and chart off from you, Josh. That's fine. Um, Let's get into Apple. Obviously we're talking about the event is here at the top of the hour. We're going to move through this pretty quickly because we still want to get to Scott Kaufman from high dividend opportunities and we'll get his take on Apple as a dividend company as well. Feel free to jump in the chat, ask us any questions along the way if you have anything. But obviously, Apple. We know Apple. I don't think anybody needs a full breakdown of Apple. They've got the products. they got the software. they got the app store. they got all these things going on. Um, so let's get into the ratings from the Seeking Alpha. Uh, Quant, Wall Street, Seeking Alpha Authors. Josh, let's go ahead and get into that slide real quick. So you have a hold by the Seeking Alpha Authors at this time. Wall Street analysts are, of course, a buy. Quant rating system is a hold, which people have always been asking about since January. It's been a hold pretty much the entire, I think the entire time, actually. Uh, Let's look at the factor grades real quick. On the factor grade front, valuation is an F. Uh, Growth is a D plus. Profitability, of course, an A plus. Momentum is an A minus, and revisions are a C. And moving on, I want to get to this next slide. So I was I was going through and I was like, what, what's something that's been the big catalyst moments here lately for Apple? Obviously, we saw the, the quick run up in the stock price. We're seeing the pullback. Um, I think it was around 155 today, 153, 157. It's kind of in this range before the event, as usually, as, as usual, as usual as it is. Um, so I pulled this uh, article from our own Yol Minkoff, who was covering this. And the highlight here for me is this is talking about how iPhone has been gaining market share, right? The iPhone has even been growing at a 5% clip over the past few years, up from 35% in 2019, 40% in 2020, 45% in 2021. Numbers are based on the installed base or the amount of smartphones currently in use. Further down, you'll see Apple even refers to its installed base as the first lever of its service business and the engine for our company. Which makes total sense to me, right? You need the iPhone, which is something that you have on have on your pocket or have on yourself all the time. You're getting on the app store. You're downloading the apps. They're running uh, their their ad revenue is going through the roof on the app store, right? You can read news. You can check your stocks. You can do all that from your iPhone. Um, no matter where you are. And I mean, you get into the iPhone, you usually end up getting the AirPods, you usually end up getting the Apple Watch. Then you probably get the MacBook Pro or the Mac or whatever else you want because they have AirDrop compatibility. They sync so beautifully together with the Bluetooth and everything that's, I mean, they just built it perfectly, right? We talk about the ecosystem, it's all there. Um, Not to mention that this company and the stock buybacks that they're doing right now. So 
here's some stats for you. Since 2012, Apple has returned $686 billion back to shareholders through buybacks and dividends. And in Q3 alone, uh, I think this was, yeah, Apple repurchased $21.7 billion worth of shares on the open market. So if there's 62 trading days, I believe this is from last, last Q3, uh, meaning Apple purchased the equivalent of $350 million worth of Apple shares daily. And in 2022, Apple has already returned $82 billion back to shareholders through buybacks and dividends. And you know that they're going to plan more buybacks. I mean, especially if the government's going to do the buyback tax, they're probably going to front load those here in Q4. We'll have to see how, what happens with that. Um, but the, the company's a, a cash-generating machine, right? So it's like, how, how much can you really expect Apple stock price to fall back before the company just starts buying it? Or Warren Buffett starts buying it again, right? Um, so let's go. Apple pays a dividend. It's worth saying. Josh, let's go ahead and go to that slide real quick. Show everybody the dividend grades for Apple. Um, one more slide, I think. There we go. I think those got turned around. So dividend safe. Whoop, oh, go back. Dividend grades. There you go. Dividend safety is an A. Dividend growth is an A plus. Dividend yield is a D, and dividend consistency is a B. You'll see down there the annual payout forward is ninety two cents. Is what we're expecting. Payout ratio is fourteen point six nine percent. I mean that's extremely favorable. Um, dividend growth for eight years straight. It is a complete powerhouse. And the last thing I want to point out about Apple before we get to Mike real quick uh, to see the charts is, uh, you know, Apple, they talk about how that's so big in the ETF. So go to the previous slide, Josh. So we're talking about ETF holdings, right? So I pulled this just this morning from Seeking Alpha. This is for uh, the SPY ETF. Apple is 7.24% of that entire ETF. Obviously a huge holding. Um, two slides forward, please, Josh. There we go. This is for the Qs, 13.54%. Now, Mike, I wanted to ask you, do you think that these are the, either of these is the biggest ETF uh, weighting wise that has Apple at the top? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, the, the largest, oh, sure. I mean, the SPY and the Qs, absolutely. I'm sure there's there's some tech ETFs that have more, more than this percentage of Apple in their holdings, but no, they're not as big as the SPY or the Qs. You, you, yeah, not you, not you as big, right. but when it comes to weighting, I mean, you said it right there. Let's go to the next slide. So what is this one right here? Any guesses? Apple at almost 25% of the ETF weighting. The XL, the one that the XL is? The, what's, the, what's the technology, XLK? This is actually the Fidelity MSCI tech ETF. You're talking about 25% wow. of this ETF is held in Apple. Obviously, something to keep an eye on. I mean, that's tradable potentially in the future, depending on what Apple does from here, right? Um, just wanted to highlight that because I think that's one that most people forget about. Now, Mike, I wanted to ask you real quick. Let's keep this condensed. We're running a little bit over. I want to get to Scott. Uh, show us what's going on with the chart. So right here, I just wanted to show real quick. We put in what's known as a second lower high. So off the June lows, Apple had a monster move. One of the best moves, I mean, you know, in, in the big name, the big name stocks, right? You can look at other stocks and said these small caps and, that went up, whatever. But I mean, for, for these big large cap stocks and Apple's basically the largest of the large caps, right? It had a monster move. But what it did is it formed what's known as a second lower high. So this was the high uh, early in the year, late late in 2021, whatever it was. And then it put in a lower high in March, and then it put in what's known as a second lower high. It's pulled off pretty decently since then, hasn't entered a quote-unquote new bear market, right, which is what people call it after a 20% down. But we're headed into the halfway back level, which is this 152.60. It's a 50% retracement of the, the low of June up to this recent high. And one of the things you have to look at when you talk about Apple, and, and it's this is a great segue when, once we bring Scott in to talk about this um, with dividends, is, you know, Apple falls into that category of too big to succeed, right? So you've heard too big to fail, right? So what's the opposite of that? Too big to succeed. It's such a large cap stock. And you're right, it's probably, right? Keyword, probably not going to get that much pullback before they start eating their own, right? Eating their young, which is buying back their own shares or something like Berkshire is going to say, whoa, this is on sale. Let's go and buy some more, right? But in the, in the same thing, 
it's not a huge dividend payer, so it doesn't attract the income crowd per se, and its growth potential might be limited, right? That's why it got that rating on, on the quant ratings, right? So I, I'm not saying get out of Apple now, but it may, you know, it, it's seen such a huge move. What else is it, what's it going to do next, right? And, and right. we don't have time to talk about this now. We can pick it up at another time. But what is the next industry that Apple is going into? That's why I think they are going to eventually come out with a car, right? But Again, not for this time, not not for this talk, right? So, you know, Amazon's going into healthcare, right? What is Apple, you know, Google has gone into education with the certifications and all that stuff. What's Apple going to go into, right? I mean, there aren't that many industries left. There's government. It's not going to go into government, right? Although I'm sure the campus in wherever they are is, is like its own government. But um, so th that's the thing. And, and I'm not saying to sell Apple. I'm not saying Apple's not a great investment here. I just have concerns is how much further is it going to go? Is it going to be a steady performer? Is it something that you could possibly use option strategies around like selling puts or, or covered call trades or stuff like that? Yeah, maybe, but that's not the scope of, of, uh, you know, of this call, as you know. Yeah. Josh, let's go ahead and go back to that, uh, the weekly chart, that first one that I had, uh, had pulled for everybody. Um, let me see. Still there, Josh? Hopefully. There we go. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, let's go to the, so what I did is I actually, I started with pulling the weekly chart. Um, zoom out, you know, when in doubt, zoom out. We always like to say that. Uh, so I was looking at this. I was like, okay, well, we've got the trend lines going there. Um, obviously, we're, we're probably going to be in a trading range for a little bit from what we can tell here. But I, I wanted to zoom in. Let's go ahead to the next slide, Josh. And then I was like, okay, we've got some moving averages. I know there's a gap above the market. Obviously, I mean, that that candlestick right there at the top tells you the bearish story, obviously. I mean, the price has tried to push up, hit that trend line, came right back down on the week. Pretty much a flat week, definitely a bearish signal, turned it back around. But we obviously see there at 152, that's the 20 simple moving average, uh, 20 simple moving average um, for Apple stock price on the weekly. So there's probably some support there. Obviously, the 61.8 Fibonacci is down there at 147. Uh, next slide, please, Josh. <clears throat> so let's look at the daily. Obviously, this is a zoomed in daily chart um, gap above the market. Actually, let's go ahead and move to the next one. I think I zoomed in as well. Yes, there we go. Obviously, you're seeing that there's a moving average right there at 152. I think that's 14. Um, and again, just to point out the Fibonacci at 147. So there's a little bit of support here. A couple of levels I would be watching, but obviously the 20 day simple moving average is turning over pretty hard at this point. Um, kind of makes me think that that gap above the market might be a gap and go unless, you know, something revolutionary happens um, with the overall global market conditions as well. Because obviously, I mean, Apple, we talk about it, how it supports the indices and everything, but they can't support everything. Um, that's just that would be unbearable for them. I mean, you you got to have a broad market turnaround, I think, for this company to really take to the upside. Now, should you invest in it now? I mean, that just depends. What's your time horizon? I think that's the case for this. If you're looking for retirement dividend plays, I mean, you can find stuff in REITs, um, better income opportunities, I think, at this time. But this is a good part to uh, bring Scott into the conversation because Scott Kaufman, he's a part of HDO, High Dividend Opportunities, Marketplace Service on Seeking Alpha. Um, we get to ask him today. Scott, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, really appreciate so it. I know me. everybody here, I mean, literally everybody's, we got people in the chat. Everybody as well, just want to remind you, if Scott's talking about anything right now about the dividend on Apple or anything else about dividends, feel free to ask a question. If you want to know something specific about dividends, this is the guy to ask. So jump in the chat. Feel free to ask those questions, and we'll get it to Scott. Um, Scott, let's start off. First off, introduce yourself, the service, but we need to get your take. What's going on with Apple's dividend? What do you think? Okay, sure. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Scott Kaufman. I'm one of the managing partners of High Dividend Opportunities. Um, if you're on Seeking Alpha, there's a good chance you've probably seen our articles or Rita Mora, the founder's face on our articles as um, we publish almost daily. Uh, we are the largest by size, but also um, one of the longest running 
um, seeking alpha marketplaces. So we have just over 6,000 members now, uh, community of everyone. We've got people who have been postal workers their entire life to fund managers and CEOs of companies in there all interacting together. Um, creates quite a environment where we can all just answer each other's questions, learn and grow. It's really great. Um, and we focus strictly on dividend investing and income investing. So uh, we're not looking really to do dividend growth as much. Uh, we don't eschew it like we enjoy and dividend raise as much as anybody else, but that's not our primary focus. Um, so looking at Apple, for example, the, the yield is so small that the yield really isn't a big part of the total return. If you're buying Apple, likely you're buying it for the, the capital gains growth, right? They're pumping more money into buying back shares and helping their share price rise than they are about paying out dividends. Um, they may over time, if they stall out and don't have any more ideas of what to invest in, they may start raising their dividend more aggressively. Um, but in all honesty, they're going to probably look more like AutoZone. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at AutoZone. They are like the hallmark for share buybacks. Um, and that's all they've done to raise their share prices. They just, whenever they have extra cash flow, they are pounding out share buybacks. They trade in almost the 3000 price range now. Um, and all they do is just keep buying back their shares. And that's great if you're looking for like a tax advantaged way to have some money and not get taxed on it as long as the market supports you, right? And Apple can't carry the market themselves being a big aspect in those indexes. The downside is, is that somebody who goes and sells the SPY or sells the queues out of their account, they're hurting Apple's share price because every share they sell erodes some of Apple's value on the side that Apple either has to buy shares back or find someone to invest them directly for. So it's a blessing and a curse to be part of the index. Definitely. And when we talk about Apple, I mean, obviously we saw that it's been eight years of dividend growth. Like, do you think this might be a company that in the future they're they're known, I think, right now so well for buying back their stock? Why not pretty much reduce the dividend to almost nothing or not eliminate it and just continue to be that play if we're looking at this as a capital appreciation stock? Right. I mean, that that's, happen? I mean, that there's a chance. Um, other companies, though, like you can become a dividend aristocrat by raising your dividend a minute amount for 25 years. So just because they don't have a high yield doesn't mean they won't continue to try and get into like that good graces with people because down the road somebody might look at that and go hey they have 26 years of dividend growth i'm going to buy them strictly because they have 26 years of dividend growth um and while that that's some people's criteria that's really not the best um criteria to use and so i doubt they'll cut their dividend because they'll make people upset but at the same time i don't think that they're going to be a dividend first mindset management ever Gotcha. I have a question over here from Beth. It says, uh, what yield percentage uh, do you find attractive for company? I guess it's the numbers. Like, how high of a yield would start to worry you? So we target, our, our model portfolio targets a, a, an 8 to 9% yield range. Um, we have some stocks that are double digits, um, but we also vet everything extremely carefully. So we're not just buying it because it's high yield. Um, then we tried to taper out on the low 6% side. We do have some stocks that we invest in that are in the four or 5% range just because the quality of the company and those typically are dividend growth oriented. But our, our target is always in the uh, eight to 9%. Um, I mean, that's around what our model portfolio is yielding right now when everything was flying high, um, you know, between this dip and the COVID drop our target dropped down towards 7% because we're not chasing yield. We're going to hold on to value and we're going to buy what's valuable and what's worthwhile. Um, so while we aim for those yields and we'll cut things off, we don't buy them strictly because of the yield either. Gotcha. We have a question here from Sam. He says, I'm putting Real uh, Realty Income Corporation under your radar. What is your comment? Obviously, Realty is a, a REIT. Are you guys favoring REITs for, or any of those yields as well? Do you guys do that? So we do. We have a number of REITs in our portfolio. Um, Actually, we do have realty income as part of our portfolio, although it's a lower yield. It's it's in a section of our portfolio that we um, bought it previously. We bought it in the 2020 dip, and we've just been holding it ever since. But we see at this point the yield being low enough in the growth that it, it, the yield's not going to go away. It, its income is going to be reliable, but it's going to end up, uh, for a lot of people who bought it before, mean again, mainly being more of a capital gains type of an investment because their yield is on the lower side. I think it's in the 4% range last time I checked. Um, and so it is something that it'll pay monthly. It is good for to rely on income. And if you don't need higher yields to you know, have your retirement be funded, if you're someone who's got a larger account and don't need higher yields, 
then something like Realty Income is going to be excellent to hold because it's just going to be reliable and it's going to pay you every month. Um, but again, it is one of those where even at the 4.3%, which is what it's trading at right now, according to SeekingAlpha.com, um, it's still a little low on my on my for my taste. So, gotcha, Mike. You have anything you want to ask? I do. So, Scott, thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of high dividend opportunities and what you do over there. So, let's talk about mistakes people make with in with looking for high dividend stocks. I think this could be a valuable lesson from somebody with uh, your well groomed experience here. Um, so, all right, inflation sucks. It's, you know, coming down, but it's still in the eight percentile, you know, the eights. So why don't I just go out and just look for the stocks with the highest yield and make up for it that way? Like, talk about it, if, if you don't mind, and if you could just off the top of your head, because, you know, I know we didn't prepare you for this, but I know you'll be able to give us a, a good, a better answer than I would, is why not just go after the highest yield? Like, what are the red flags that you look for in companies that keep them off your model portfolio, keep them out of, pardon me, your model portfolios? Yeah, good question. So whenever a company is paying a dividend, right, all the dividend yield is, is the determination between what the dividend is and the price of the company. So some companies have accidental high yields where um, sentiment has changed. The company's running fine. The company's great. The payout is covered, but sentiment has changed, right? And that short-term sell-off, there's fear. Kind of like um, EPR recently had a sell-off because people are concerned about one of their clients who is very open that, hey, we're not trying to get rid of our rent. We just need to restructure our debt. And their properties are essential for that business to operate it's going to have a short-term, you know, accidental high yield, which will have an overhang because of sentiment. Whereas there's other companies or funds that artificially have high yields because they pay out way more than they can ever afford. Um, especially that's more prevalent in like high yield funds where they're paying out more than they can afford. Their NAV is eroding and all that they're doing is supporting it by either selling more shares or the fund is slowly dwindling down. Um, and so whenever we look at high yield anything, we, we look at cash flow, money in, money out. And if they can't cover their yield, they can't cover their dividend, then that's a huge red flag. Um, the other red flag that will come up a lot of times is management trying to oversell, right? I, I think uh, all of us can remember um, High Crush. They were an oil, sand, they were a sand fracking sand provider. And they spiked, they raised their dividend to a huge amount and attracted a ton of investor attention simply because they paid a high dividend for a couple of quarters. And they talked it up every earnings call about how they were going to do that. All the while, they they had they couldn't afford it. And then three quarters later, the company basically got bought out for the smallest amount ever and the dividend was cut to zero. And it was really just a way to almost like float them until they could get their private buyout done. Um, and so a big thing is the ability to pay. If you can't pay it, 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 you don't want to buy something that can't be paid. And so I don't like cash flow negative companies. I don't like companies that um, the dividend is unsupported or unsustainable simply because if it, you can't pay it now and you have no clear path to pay it later, then all you're getting is, is you're getting basically your money back before the company goes under. Yeah. We have a, uh, a question come in from T Marks over here in the Zoom chat. Uh, it says, do you like CTR Re, Care Trust Re? Is that, is that a company you follow? Not a company that I follow directly. Let me take. Um, Let's go ahead. And I'm going to pull it up here for everybody to take a look at it here on Seeking Alpha. Um, share price is around $21. Author, the Seeking Alpha authors have a hold on the stock. Wall Street's a buy. Quant rating is a strong buy. Factor grades look pretty favorable. You, you know, valuation B minus, gross C, profitability B minus, momentum A plus, and revisions a B plus. Um, Quant actually has it ranked in the industry at number one out of the 14 peers that is up against. Um, dividend safety is a D plus, dividend growth is a C, dividend yield is a B, and consistency is an A minus. So any thoughts? So just offhand, looking at it very quickly, with REITs, you want to look at their FFO, right? Their funds from operation that really strips right out at the top, all of we their- We got 1.51. Yes, for the exactly. And, yep. and, it, and it strips out all of the, you know, the non um, cash flow items. And so they're paying a dividend that is less than their FFO, which is a really positive thing to see, right? You want to see that they can cover that. And you don't necessarily want to use gap earnings. We get a lot of questions from people who are new to REITs and they're looking at 
gap earnings and, and how gap earnings isn't covering the dividend. And they're like, this gap payout ratio is you know, terrible. And we'll let them know, hey, gap earnings includes depreciation of assets. And when you're a REIT and you've got large buildings, those things are technically gap depreciating every single year, and that's not affecting cash flow. Here, we're seeing an FFO that is covering the dividend, um, more so than the dividend, which is really good. Um, and so it's something like this would be something that would potentially warrant further investigation. Again, the yield is a little bit below the yield range that we actually, that we look for. Um, but it is something that if that FFO is covering it and it's sustainable, then that's going to be something that, that would definitely be attractive. That's amazing. Scott, I want to ask you before we get, let you get out of here. Um, well, two questions, actually. First, just maybe briefly, do you think that there's any stocks right now kind of that are under the radar when it comes to dividends that people should be analyzing if they want to enter a new dividend in their portfolio or maybe they're heavy on a dividend portfolio? Sure. So one idea that um, we've mentioned to HDO members a couple of times is Diversified Royalty Corp. They're a royalty corporation, so that, which is a Canadian structure. Um, basically, if you think about it, they, what they do is they own the franchise rights to a bunch of different companies. Their ticker is BEVFF, um, which is the, an OTC ticker in Canada. Their ticker is just DIV. Um, they own the royalty rights to a bunch of different brands. And so they make their money just right off the top. Um, for example, they have a, um, they operate in what's called like a Jiffy Lube, their oil change location in Canada and they own the rights to it. So if you go get your oil changed, a set percentage of that top line um, goes directly to them. And so it's a really straightforward and simple structure. And um, they did get hit pretty hard during COVID simply because the economy shut down and nobody's shopping at their locations, um, like most retail oriented items. The, um, and on the other side though, now that inflation is picking up and prices are rising, their revenue just climbs from there. And so that is one thing um, that we like is that right off the top, they're going to be almost like an inflation play. If inflation stays persistent, prices rise further, their, their top line and bottom line revenue is just going to climb. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing this. And before we let you get out of here, the people want to know, we end every episode like this. Obviously, everybody shows up. We have Anna, we got Christian, Dave, we got a lot of the people coming back. Jorge's here again today, this week. He's usually in the chat. Roland, Roger, Nick, everybody wants to know, Scott, we need a story of a, a, the best trade you've ever had or one of the worst trades that helped you learn not to make a mistake again. What do you got for us? Okay, so I can give you one of either one. Um, real quick, <clears throat> during 2020, um, M rates were being you know, destroyed left, right, and center with the drop of prices in, in, in mortgage MBS prices dropped like crazy. And um, we actually authored an article for HDO members about which M rates were dangerous and which ones were gonna survive just fine. Um, and so in that article, we talked about what was Xanatis there. They've changed now name to Acres. Um, and we talked about their preferred and we're like, hey, this preferred is going to be great. It's deferred on their dividend right now, but it's going to climb back. At that point, it was about $3 for the preferred share versus this $25 par. Um, and so I bought a whole bunch of that. Uh, a lot after we told HDO members about it, we have a policy to tell them first. And then once they know, we can buy it as well. And so once we shared that out, I bought a whole bunch of it. Um, and by the end of uh, 2020, its share price is back over $27 per share and they paid out their dividend. So I had like a 50% yield on cost. Um, and that was one of the one of the best short-term trades. I sold it after a year um, and locked in the long-term capital gains there. And I've actually re-entered it again once it went back under par. Um, so I'm currently long it now. And then- um, <laughs> Heard it here first, folks. And then back the- in um, the for like a, the downside, I would say is high crush. I did buy a small speculative position in high crush along with everybody else. I was one of the people who bought it, unfortunately near the top with a small speculative position. Um, and I walked away with an, a, a good loss to claim on my taxes against my dividend income um, with that one as well, simply because at that point I was still, you know, not doing, I, I bought a speculative so I can monitor it on the side and not keep a close eye on it. And next thing I know, it just, it went, it crashed and burned. And I was like, oh, there, okay, there goes that speculative position. Um, and sometimes that happens. I'll buy a few shares of something just to watch it. And sometimes those shares that I'd watch, will, I'll watch them disappear. So, yeah. 
Oh, we learned from it. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time for us today. We've uh, got to wrap things up here. We told everybody we were going to let them get to the Apple <laughs> event. Obviously, yep. everybody's got eyes on it. So, Scott, thanks for joining us. You have a great rest of the day, all right? All right thank you for having me. All right. All right. And just a reminder, Josh, go ahead and throw up that last slide for me. If you guys want to pitch us a stock idea for us to cover for next week's episode, if you have questions for us, you can, of course, reach us all across the web. We've got me on LinkedIn, Mike Saul. There's his email address right there. Stock ideas. You can send them to stock market live at seekingalpha.com. And of course, you can talk to Scott Kaufman over on high dividend opportunities on Seeking Alpha. All opinions shared today are our opinions. We're just here showing you what we're looking at. Mike, anything you want to say to the people before we hop off? No, that's it. Thank you so much for attending today. We want to get you off to that Apple event, if that's your particular brand of vodka. And uh, have fun. See you later, that's, guys. Thanks for joining mine. us. Yep, absolutely. Josh, get us on out of here. Let's go to the Apple event.